and welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime and today I'm really looking forward to continuing our discussion about the Gallo crew by telling you about Crazy Joe's brothers Larry and Albert. Despite Crazy Joe being the most famous of the brothers, Larry was actually the brains and leader of the crew for many years before he passed away and Albert, well there's just plenty to say about him. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to that Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss, so let's get right to it. Lawrence and Albert Gallo Jr. were the infamous brothers of Joe Gallo. Larry was born on November 3rd, 1927, and Albert, named after his father, was born on June 6th, 1930. As a brief review from the family history covered in the spotlight on Joe Gallo, who would go on to be the most famous or infamous of the three brothers, the boys were born to Umberto, or Albert, and Mary Nunciato Gallo. Albert Sr. had been a successful bootlegger during the Prohibition era. He would take his ill-gotten gains and invest them back into crime in the form of loan sharking specifically. Unlike many gangster fathers during this era, his hope for his sons was not to improve their station, but rather to have them follow in his footsteps. He groomed his sons to be successful criminals, and to his credit, he succeeded in that task. The Gallo brothers grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and would soon be among the most powerful men in the area. Larry Gallo, taking full advantage of his father's connections, would get to work right away in the extortion game, focusing his efforts on the lucrative jukebox and vending machine rackets. His brother Joe would later join him in this endeavor. Larry, although the least famous, is actually credited with being the brains of the operations. He was cunning, kept a low profile, and when the Gallo crew really came into existence, he was the leader. Although many do give credit to Joe Gallo as the leader, and he would be later on. If we were going to make a cinematic comparison, Larry Gallo was the Michael Corleone, and Joe Gallo was more like the Sonny. However, that's not to say that their younger brother Albert was necessarily like Fredo, although that's not to say that he was unlike Fredo. Albert Jr. was reported early on as being weak-willed, so in a sense I suppose he would have been the Fredo of his family, although later he would outgrow and outsmart that unfortunate positioning. We'll talk more about Albert a bit later. Back to Larry, he had major holdings in the Brooklyn jukebox rackets, and by the mid-1940s, Joe was on board. It was extremely helpful for Larry to have his brother working as his confidant and co-conspirator, as well as his unhinged muscle. They created a jukebox vending machine owners association to better control that racket. They also, with the help of associates Vincent Amalfitano, Ernest Zundel, and Joe de Grandis, worked their way into positions of authority in the Teamsters Local Number 266. It was in part because of their success at extorting money from Brooklyn vending and jukebox machine operators that Larry and his brothers were later subpoenaed to testify in 1958 before the McClellan Synod Committee. They were questioned by Robert Kennedy, a senator at the time and brother to John F. Kennedy. RFK would later go on to be the U.S. Attorney General. During Kennedy's line of questioning, all the brothers would plead the Fifth Amendment and refuse to engage with his questions. Larry, and Albert as well, took a much more low-key approach to questioning than their brother Joe did, who made a spectacle of himself during the hearings. And you can hear more about that on the previous episode about Joe Gallo. A lot of this is going to be review since they were brothers. Larry, as you could always count on him to do, kept a cool head under pressure, and remained as far from center stage as possible. The Gallo brothers had previously caught the attention of Joe Profaci, head of what is now the Colombo family. This was through their connection with the Profaci-affiliated Harry Fontana crew. Both Larry and Joey became made members of the Profaci family. Albert actually remained an associate and was never given an offer to be a made man with the Colombo family. And it wouldn't take long before these brothers, upon seeing the unrest created by Profaci's greed, would take the opportunity to make a move to take control of the family themselves. Their confidence in their ability to do that really began with the murder of Albert Anastasia. The murder many believe was carried out by Joe Gallo, and some sources contend that his brother Albert participated as well. Some sources do claim that all three brothers were involved in the Anastasia murder. To me, that doesn't sound like something that Larry could have been easily persuaded to do, but I wasn't there. The Gallo brothers increased control of gambling operations for the family meant that their power was growing alongside unrest among the soldier class within the family. The unrest from the brothers themselves was really set into motion when Joe Gallo was contracted to kill Frank Abedamarco, one of Profaci's own men whom he suspected of withholding money. Gallo did the job, but the Gallo crew did not see an increase within their holdings. The Gallos then made their move, kidnapping several of Profaci's men and holding them hostage. Profaci himself escaped to Florida in order to negotiate from a distance. Joe Gallo, the most hot-headed of the three brothers, had wanted to kill one of their captives to send Profaci a message. 
Albert and specifically Larry, felt that Joe was being too rash. They sent him out west for a vacation and released the hostages in order to open up talks with Perfacci. Larry, the leader of the Gallo brothers, was perhaps too clever by half with this decision. Perfacci never had any intention of negotiating with the brothers. We broke down this war in detail in the previous episode, but just as a reminder, one of Gallo's top men, Joseph Gioielli, would be murdered on a fishing trip with some of Perfacci's men. Well, he disappeared and then a dead fish was sent to the Gallos. I suppose we don't know that he was murdered. Larry Gallo, whose murder had been ordered the same day as Gioielli's, August 20th, 1961, would be duped into meeting with some of Perfacci's men at the Sahara Club. This would result in an attempted murder by strangulation by a young Carmine Persico and Salvatore D'Ambrosio. Fortunately for Larry, law enforcement agents happened to see his feet sticking out from behind the bar and intervened. This is the moment that inspired the scene of the attempted murder of Frank Pentangeli by the Risotto brothers in The Godfather 2. The best sequel of all time, and I'm not willing to debate this in the comments with you. It was because of this flip that Persico, previously aligned with the Gallo Rebellion, first earned his nickname the Snake after he attempted to take out Larry. It's probably a good thing for Persico and D'Ambrosio that it was Larry who they failed to eliminate instead of his more temperamental little brother. Later in 1961, Persico was actually indicted for the attempted murder of Larry Gallo, but Gallo, true to his nature and loyal to the tradition of Omerta, would refuse to testify against him, and the charges were dropped. This war went on to encompass nine murders and three disappearances, the majority of which was carried on the Gallo brothers' shoulders. They were the ones who were losing. By the end of 1961, Joe Gallo was imprisoned for 7 to 14 years for extortion. This meant that all decisions for the crew were placed completely in the hands of Larry and the less than strong-willed Albert. In a strange tangential point about Larry and Albert, while Joe was imprisoned in February of 1962, they, along with four of their men, were going back to their headquarters following lunch when they noticed an apartment building was on fire. They sprang into action and wound up saving the lives of six small children. While Larry was being treated for smoke inhalation, Albert told the press, With our crummy luck, I suppose we'll be arrested for putting out a fire without a license. Far from it, actually. They were briefly treated as heroes and celebrated in the press. One of the children's mothers said of them, they are good boys, God bless them. Even the fire chief, Alexander Stetter, had to give them some props, saying, They did a good job. When we got there, they had taken care of everything. They had the fire out and the kids out. A very good job. And this would encompass the one and only time that the Gallo brothers were in the news for a good reason. Profaci would die of cancer on June 7, 1962. Profaci's brother-in-law, Joseph Magliocco, took control briefly before he too died of cancer in 1963. Although Magliocco was already losing favor with the Mafia Commission as he had plans to overthrow them, but that's a story for a different day, with the assistance of the Patriarca family, as power from the Profaci faction was being shifted to Joe Colombo. The heads of the Gallo crew, Larry and Albert, were open to peace negotiations. Larry and Albert were probably enthusiastic to take the offer, Although the Gallo crew did successfully weaken, distract, and occasionally win a few battles against the Perfacci faction, they were losing men left and right, and the brothers knew that this war was not sustainable. They reached a peace agreement in 1963 without any input from Joe. In 1965, Larry and Albert would both be sentenced to six months behind bars after pleading guilty to misdemeanor assault. Later, they would apparently be recruited to help ease race relations in Brooklyn in 1966, with less than ideal results given the horrible race relations that continued in the city through the 1960s and into the 1970s. Albert Gallo would be indicted in 1967 for coercion in illegal gambling operations. Other than this, the Gallo crew and the Colombo family operated in peace through the end of the 1960s and into the beginning of the 1970s. Complications began when Larry Gallo died of cancer in May of 1968, and Joe Gallo was officially made the leader of the crew while he was still wrapping up his sentence. Joseph Colombo had created several potential enemies in his career, including his former colleague Carlo Gambino, now a rival family boss. Many of these issues came along with the creation of the Italian-American Civil Rights League, the alleged human rights group which made it its goal to eliminate the connection in the American public's eye between Italian-Americans and the Mafia. This entire operation, of course, is ironic because it was run by a Mafia boss. Anyway, it's important to keep in mind that Colombo had many enemies, but for our purposes today, we should note that Joe Gallo was released from prison in 1971. He was furious that his crew had come to a peace agreement with the Colombos while he was put away. Joe Gallo, now in control of his crew, 
would spiral the family back into a war known as the Second Colombo War. Joe Colombo was shot in an attempted murder later that year that left him paralyzed for the rest of his life. The war would wrap up on April 7, 1972, when Joe Gallo was murdered while celebrating his birthday at Umberto's Clam House. The deaths of both Larry and Joe Gallo left the crew in a strange position. By virtue of his name only, it seems to be implied by several sources, Albert Gallo was made into the boss of the crew, one man who had seemed like a good choice as successor, but would submit to the decision to place Albert Gallo as leader was John Cutrone, a man who had been loyal to both Larry and Joe throughout their time leading the Gallo crew. We'll come back to Cutrone soon. Albert would prove to be a less than competent leader. He would attempt to have Carmine Persico's brother Alphonse and eventual Colombo family underboss Gennaro Langella murdered after finding out that they would be having a meeting together at the Neapolitan Noodle Restaurant in Manhattan. To take these men out, Gallo commissioned Las Vegas hitmen who would completely botch the assignment. Instead of killing their targets, the hitmen shot four innocent civilians, killing two of them, leaving Persico and Langella to escape unharmed. This failure, along with the fact that the crew was losing money under Albert Gallo, created unrest within the ranks, especially from Cutrone and those who had hoped to see him become the next crew captain. Cutrone and the men loyal to him would leave the Gallo crew to place themselves under the authority of the Colombo family proper in 1974. It should be stated again that Cutrone was a loyalist to both Larry and Joe Gallo. It took a lot for him to betray the Gallo family name, but Albert, it seemed, pushed him over the edge. After this, the year was filled with murders and attempted murders as the Cutrone and the Gallo factions began fighting one another. The first shots were fired from Gallo's side, as they had spied on and attempted to shoot two Cutrone loyalists, Jerry Basciano and Sammy Zarobam. They were both injured but survived. In August, Steve Cirillo, a Gallo loyalist, was shot and killed at a charity benefit in a Brooklyn synagogue. Then, in September, a sniper shot and seriously injured, although did not kill, perhaps one of the most loyal to the Gallo family, Frank Iliano, a childhood friend of Joey's now serving as Albert Gallo's right-hand man. The constant conflict, always connected to the Gallo crew within the Colombo family, led to the Mafia Commission finally stepping in to put a stop to it during this bloody 1974 year. The commission plucked the Gallo crew from the Colombo family and placed them instead beneath the leadership of Genovese Capo Vincent Gigante, which I believe marks the first and only time that a crew was plucked from one family by the commission and placed under the authority of another, but if you have another example, please let me know in the comments. I just can't think of another time that this has happened. Additionally, the Gallo crew was made to submit to a peace agreement with the Cutrone crew. Despite this agreement, tensions between the two factions continued. Continued. In February of 1976, one of Gallo's men, Stephen Borriello, was shot and wounded by sniper fire while at the Gallo headquarters. This was obviously the work of the Cutrone crew, and Gallo took this to the heads of his new family, the Genoveses. The Genoveses spoke with the Colombos on Gallo's behalf, and the Colombos obliged, calling a meeting with Cutrone and Basciano, Cutrone's main loyalist, to discuss peace once again. Cutrone and Basciano ignored the meeting request and refused to engage in peace talks with Colombo leadership. Big mistake. Not long after this disrespect, Basciano was shot and killed on June 16, 1976. Cutrone went into hiding, but was quickly informed by the Colombo family that Basciano's murder was the only one required to restore peace between the families. This would turn out, it seems, to be a lie from the Colombo family, who was fed up with these warring factions. Cutrone was shot and killed on October 5, 1976, and no retaliation response was ever seen from the Columbos after the murder of one of their made men. In that same year, Albert Gallo would be made into the Genovese family, the very first time that this Gallo brother was finally officially made into a mafia family. Albert Gallo hasn't really made any waves since 1976, although his name has occasionally popped up here and there. He's still alive to this day. At the age of 91, he'll be 92 this June. It seems that the issues caused by the Gallos all died off with those connected to Larry and Joe. Albert seemed to be content staying in his lane and doing what was asked of him. Perhaps had Larry Gallo lived, the story would have been different, but following his death and Joey's, Albert was adrift as a leader and wasn't able to really have peace until he was once again returned to a position of following orders. Albert Gallo Jr. has since retired, although he is still listed among the active captains in the Genovese family. Most agree that his role is more like that of a mafia advisor. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews discussing the brothers of Crazy Joe Gallo, Larry, and Albert. 
Larry and Albert were not nearly as unhinged as their brother, who seemed to suffer from a severe case of middle child syndrome. One can only speculate what would have happened if Larry Gallo had been the brother to survive instead of Albert, but that will only be speculation at best. What we can say for sure is that it worked out for Albert, and I think that the chips really fell in his favor as he'll be 92 this year and stayed out of trouble for the better part of nearly five decades. Make sure to let me know in the comment section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about the Gallo brothers. Also, don't forget to utilize that comment section in social media to let me know about who or what you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you, and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your soapbox. Ciao.